Hey everyone. Okay, so uh, we're here. We're ready for our second lecture, our actual first full lecture of material for the class, which is pretty cool. You can check out these specific learning objectives. Again, that clo.pdf that's in the main directory of the GitHub repository is going to have all of these specific numbered um, learning objectives. So if you want to check out, and it's cross reference for all the lectures that we're going to do as well. So if you want to check that out, go ahead and do so. Um, but this is what we're going to focus on. I'm not always going to cover them um, specifically, but I will. Um, but I will always have them up. So just before we get started, I wanted to talk with a couple things. Um, oops. For some reason, my music started, so we do that. Um, here's some tips for these flipped type lectures. So we're probably going to do most of the first unit as a flipped lecture. Uh, just so you know, um, have a notepad and pen handy so you can write these things down if you have any questions. Uh, things that seem confusing, you don't totally understand, anything that you might be wondering about, uh, anything that you're just curious about and it's like sort of mildly connected with the topic that we're, we're talking about today. Uh, we'll always start the in-class portion. Um, I'm always going to have time for questions from lecture material, okay? So just go ahead and write those things down so you don't forget. Um, we're not going to cover the lecture material again because that wouldn't be a good use of time, but we're always I'm always happy to clarify anything in the lectures go back to the slides look at them stuff like that anything you need that's when you should ask. Um, also, especially for this one be sure to pause the video and work through the check your understanding questions. These help you solidify those uh, concepts that we're working on in class. And if you can't do one, it's really important to ask at the beginning of the class to go over it. The check your understanding sometimes will have the correct answer, but won't, I won't always go through what the correct answer is. So if you don't understand why the answer is correct or there's not a correct answer and you can't do it, then go ahead, write that down and be sure to bring it up in the first time of class. I guarantee you, if you have a question on something, someone else in the room is definitely has the same question okay um i want to make sure that everybody's solid before we move forward and doing all this stuff so let's talk about the topic for today how computers work instructions for this lecture so um we have some videos to start off with because code.org just does these super slick videos that are really really well explained and really really well produced i want you to go ahead and watch these next five videos um Check out the lecture notes PDF on the GitHub repository and then return to this Panopto video. So put it on pause, stop the video, go watch those five videos. And I'm going to go through the five that I want you to re uh, uh, watch really fast and then start back on this video once you've already watched those through. So I'm going to pretend or I'm going to act like you've already watched these videos. So if you keep on with this one, it might not make a whole lot of sense. So these are the videos. Uh, what is a computer? Um, what makes a computer a computer? Um, how computers work, binary and data. How computers work, circuits and logic. And how computers work, software and hardware. So those are the code.org ones. And then there's an extra understanding memory versus storage. So go ahead, pause the video here, go watch those five videos. They're all pretty short, maybe five or six minutes long. Come back when you're done. I'm waiting so that you pause, you have a chance to pause and then you can come back. Okay, we're back, right? Okay, so we're gonna do our first check your understanding. What are the four things that all computers have in common? Is it input, output, virtual reality and processing? Is it input, output, processing and storage? Is it hardware, software, circuits and logic? Or is it CPUs, hard drive, memory and buses? Okay, which one is correct? Again, pause the video if you need to uh, like grind it out in your head. We're going to go ahead and go over the correct answer. It's input, output, processing, and storage. Some of these other things, there are CPUs and hard drive memory buses. Those are common components of modern computers, but you don't actually have to have them. Back in the old days when computers were huge and the size of big rooms and warehouses, they used to use vacuum tubes uh, instead of these things, uh, instead of wires for circuits. So you don't have to have them for a computer. These are the four things that you have, all computers have in common. 
Okay, so let's recap the videos really fast, just in case you um, maybe didn't pull all the information out that you wanted, or how about this? This is the stuff that I really want you to know from those videos. A computer is a device that takes input and storage, performs processing, and then produces output, just like we said those four things in common. Computers operate on binary systems, so they have a one or zero, a true or false, on, off. Um, to create and store informations in a variety of forms. That binary video is so great because it goes over actually how to calculate in binary, which I think is super cool. Computers use basic circuits and logic to perform a variety of calculations in binary, which is cool. But no one actually uses that binary language to talk to computers because there's special software that converts back and forth between that computer binary language, which is the only thing a computer can really understand, and human readable coding languages like R, which are called compilers. So the, the languages themselves are not uh, like R isn't a compiler, it's the software that converts it back and forth. Okay, so the uh, software that can takes like uh, R code that you can kind of read and understand or you will be after uh, this this course, and it converts it to that binary uh, language so that the computer can actually do things and operate. Computers possess both hardware, the physical devices and circuits, so like hardware, my mouse is an input device hardware, uh, and software, so pro programs and logic that tells the hardware what to do, okay? Hardware includes the central processing unit, storage, memory, connections, input and output devices. Okay, so that's all hardware, so it's that exists physically. And software includes the operating system, which coordinates all the programs running on the computer, as well as a CPU, the storage, um, how that's used and organized, and memory usage, so how that's actually used by the computer. Okay, what does this mean for you? So when we talk about programming on a computer, we have to be really mindful of what's going on sort of under the hood, so to speak, because if you don't, then some things are going to just be frustrating because you'll try to do something, the computer won't do it, and you'll wonder why, okay? So when we're, uh, when we're programming in R, I want you to think about a few different things. So write these down because they're important. Inputs and outputs. What information are you giving to the computer and what would you like the output to look like? So what sort of things that you're typing in, right? You're using an input device, either the keyboard or the mouse, um, some kind of input device. What are you actually using to tell the computer and what sort of commands are you using to tell the computer? And what do you want the computer, what, the, what does the final product look like, okay? So think really carefully about those things. Those are again gonna be constrained uh, by, you know, the, the, the types of programs that we have to use, you know, you're going to be cons pretty constrained by using a keyboard for output, uh, and probably not voice command, right? And that's a different input device, a microphone. Um, and the outputs are going to be pretty constrained too, but if you really think carefully about those things, it's going to help the process along a lot. Languages and circuits, ultimately computers only understand that binary, the one, the zero, the true, the false, okay? So how can you can create instructions that can tell the computer exactly what steps it needs to do and perform to perform the calculations you want, okay? So this is gonna be really important because if I want to highlight all, you know, highlight all text that says the word read in it, you know, in a block of text, I have to figure out how to tell it in the commands that I already have that are written how to to find the word read and then turn that a different color okay and so if you think about steps based on what you want to do it's going to be a lot easier when we get down to programming um, and part of that learning uh, is learning what commands are available in R right learning um, how to use conditional statements this if it's true you want to do this if it's false you want to do this other thing right these are all things we're going to go over but just think about that structure in your head when we start out okay and storage and memory be mindful of what is stored on the hard drive so remember storage and memory are separate right what's permanently stored on the hard drive versus what's in memory so what's in that random access quick uh, volatile memory that you have. Again, if you're trying to tell the computer to do something with, uh, and you assume it's in memory, but it's actually in storage, 
it's going to be sad for you, right? Because it'll just be like, oh, the computer's like, oh, I don't know what that is. I don't know what it's doing. Okay. So be mindful of what's in storage versus memory. Uh, and that it saw, will solve a lot of problems. But I want to kind of focus in today on the storage and memory issue as well, because some of the fundamental ways that we interact with computers and uh, how computers work um, really have to do with this divide between storage and memory. And remember that divide in the very last video, the fifth video talks about how storage is way cheaper, um, but it's really, really slow. It's slow to access um, uh, storage on a hard drive or a solid state hard drive or something like that. Memory is very volatile. It's really fast, but it's really expensive. So there's less memory. And so your computer is constantly swapping out things that you need right now in the instant versus things that you don't really need right now. So trying to free up that memory, right? Uh, put it back in storage so they can use it later. So let's talk a little bit more about how this happens. Okay, we're gonna talk about file systems. Um, believe it or not, this is how computers actually handle storage um, and memory, okay? So how, how uh, storage is organized is based on the file system of the computer. The purpose is to provide a non-volatile storage and organization for that information on the computer that you'll need later, but maybe you don't need in this millisecond, right? Okay, so files, uh, they consist of files. Sometimes I'll call them items. If it's a file or directory, I'll call it an item, but they can be image files, audio files, video files, binary files, code files, etc. Any sort of thing that's sort of like a terminal file on that computer is, uh, uh, is part of that file system, okay? Um, the parts of it are going to be the namespace. So there are certain names, uh, uh, rules for naming files, okay? And these used to be really, really strict, and they're much less strict now. But we'll talk about this namespace sort of naming rules that you may want to uh, make your life a little bit easier. Uh, made it metadata. So this is information about the actual items, okay? So information about what the file name is, how big it is, so how much storage does it take up, where is the physical location? of that file on the hard drive so the computer can access it, uh, when was it created, um, and things like permissions, uh, security. So who gets access to that file and what kind of access do they have? So maybe you can look at a file, but you can't alter it, you can't execute it, or you can't uh, overwrite it, right? So all that stuff um, is part of that metadata structure. Uh, Another thing is called an API, an application program interface. And this is like it, it, the type of software that you need to interact with that specific type, file type. So if you think about when you double click something like a MP4, a video file, uh, you know, the computer has to figure out what's the appropriate you know, application on your computer to actually play the file for you, do whatever it is it needs to do to open it and that's called an API. Okay, so not a big deal. All right, so the operating system, this is also called the kernel sometimes. So I'm going to use a little corn because I always think of a corn kernel when um, I hear this word, but the kernel or the operating system interacts with this virtual file system and the virtual file system organizes drivers, all sorts of stuff with which is essentially software that talks to the hardware. Right, again, this uh, API software that talks to the hardware, you need to get it down to those uh, the binary bits, right? Because um, that's how everything is storage, but there's a lot of steps in between that. So uh, this is kind of the way that the operating system interacts with the actual computer, how it's organized and how the storage, uh, how the storage is organized. Okay, so here's actually a screenshot from a, a folder that I have, and you can see a bunch of files here and a bunch of like junk here that's copied down. So this is the permissions. Okay, so this, uh, the dash R, W, dash R, dash R. So all of this stuff um, is a specific, uh, it's a specific um, code that we're not really gonna go over for Linux, but it's just a specific code that says, I is, am the owner of the file and I can read and write it and do all of these things. And then it's different types of people. Like if you are an outside user, um, if you're you know, uh, an inside user. Okay, so you can read those things, but you can't write them and you can't execute them. Um, there's more information on the file. Like I'm the person, what 
uh, level I am and staff is just like the, the default um, level if you're if you're uh, uh, if you're the owner of that computer, um, how big it is. So this is how many bits the file occupies. And then December 15th, 2016 was the last time was the, the date that this file was created. And then of course, here are the file names all over here. And these have really specific rules about what sort of characters you're allowed to use in a file name, because this stuff also has a bunch of different, um, a bunch of different functions in command line. So you don't want to like, uh, name your file something that's going to conflict with the command uh, in the command line. Okay, so navigating file systems. This is really important, right? Because you know that uh, you know you have to interact with these files. The kernel has to interact with them. So how does that happen? Um, this happens through something called shells, and I'm going to use a little oyster shell emoji for shell. So a shell is a special program that helps you and the kernel navigate and interact with this file system. So when you think about shells, there's basically two types. There's command line shell, which is bash, bash, uh, ZHS is um, what, so bash is, is uh, was the default command, uh, command line shell for I think before Catalina um, on Mac OS X. And then ZSH is the new one um, that's default. Of course, I've just turned it back to bash because I don't want to learn something new. Um, MS-DOS or command line shell for uh, Windows machines, OK? So you navigate by entering specific commands in the shell, OK? So it's a little bit different, right, because you're not clicking and pointing. Um, you actually have to enter commands to move around the, uh, make the shell move around um, the hard drive. Uh, the other type is a graphical use, user interface or a GUI, a GUI shell. So things like Finder, Windows Explorer, um, Pantheon are GUI shells, which help you navigate by just clicking graphics. So this is the what Bash looks like, and this is what Finder in Mac OS looks like. And this is actually the same folder um, that I'm in here. So you can see that the computer kid got dot GIF, which is our canvas. Um, uh, canvas banner image is here because it's actually the same folder. Uh, this is just two ways to represent those and two ways to interact. This is the command line. And so this is where you would enter codes like list ls is list all the files in this directory um, versus pointing and clicking uh, gives you uh, a lot less. So, so the trade off here is that you have a lot more power and flexibility in com command line if you know how to use it. Uh, but finder is much quicker because you're just pointing and clicking on things. Okay, so at this point, I want to kind of go into both Finder um, and here I'm going to open a new Finder and bring it over here for you. And then I'm going to open Command Line and get a new window in here for you. So I'm going to add that. And we're going to look at two ways of going both shells. So this is a shell here. So I'm going to go to my home directory here. And so we're both in the same place right now. Um, interacting with it is obviously really different. Here I can see a list and all of these, all of these sort of uh, uh, lightened up uh, files are what's called hidden files. See, they have a dot right there, which means it's hidden. Um, it doesn't usually show up on your finder. So you might only see these brighter uh, folders like this. Uh, but, and when I list these out, so ls will list, do the same thing that, that Finder does here for me, list those things. Um, it's not listing those hidden files here. If I want to list the hidden files, I have to use a, a what's called a flag, this dash a. By the way, all of this command line stuff, don't worry about it. I'm just going to show you how, like, they're kind of similar, but you do not have to do this command line at all, okay? So now you can see all of this hidden stuff with the, with the dots up here, okay? So to navigate through this file system, maybe I wanna go to uh, my desktop and see what's on there. I would click here, but here I have to use a change directory. So change directory desktop, okay? And now I'm in the desktop and I can list, yeah, that's fine. Um, I can list all of the, the uh, folders on this. And so you can see that they're about the same here. They're like weird, I have little, little weird videos over here, of course, in the screenshot here. Okay, if I want to go back to the this directory, I can uh, click over here somewhere. Oop. Well, I can click back. 
actually don't know how to do that if you don't have a folder. Oh, you click on here. There we go. Um, OK, so I go back and we can go into my Dropbox, which is has a lot of different stuff in it. Um, here's a cool picture, probably. I don't know why it's not giving me a. There we go. So there is a cool meme that I saved. I'm so cool, guys. I use like a ton of memes. So I can go into my Dropbox. And it's a little complicated there. Uh, and these are what's called escape characters. We won't worry about that. But if we list, we can see all sorts, sorts of stuff. OK, so um, now it's uh, we're getting a lot of different stuff, right? Here's the, the same picture that's here uh, in this thing. Um, and if I want to list uh, human readable and all along, you get a lot of information here. OK, so you're getting a lot of information about each one of these files. You get the same information over here. OK, so I want to list all this information just about what is this 4x here. OK, so here's all of that information. Um, it's telling you the same thing. It's created on February 12th, right? It's uh, uh, zero. Um, it's zero bytes because I have it on the cloud right now. But it's giving me a little picture. So the metadata it's loading for me is a little bit different between the two, right? I have a lot of about permissions and who who does it and how the biggest size and, and stuff like this. But here the metadata in Finder is actually a little bit different because it's showing me a preview of this um, as well as in in addition to when it was modified um, and when it was created. Okay, and so it's got like a tags online only for tag, right? Uh, which are other information that's only available in this GUI preview. So that's kind of how uh, both of these shells work. So they're both shells. Um, they just work, uh, you're interacting, your input is different for each one of those things. Okay, so that's a little bit clear. Again, you don't need to worry about the shells, uh, the command line. We're not gonna worry about that too much. Uh, I just wanted to show you the kind of the difference in that they're each interacting and they're helping you and the kernel interact with the file system. Okay, so working directory, how files, file systems handle memory. This is really super important. So um, directories are, uh, I'm going to say these little folder like things. They are also called folders. You'll hear me call them folders all the time because people like to use folders uh, to organize like actual pieces of paper and then files are down here, which are inside folders, OK? So directories are subdivisions of the file system that contain files, OK? Directories are created by the user. Some are created by the operating system, programs, et cetera. They can be created by all sorts of different things, but they help organize this information so it doesn't get too overwhelming. Directories contain items like binary files, computer, computer codes, um, and other directories, OK? Um, because directories can, can contain other directories, they have a hierarchical structure. So you can see that this is a higher directory over here than this one right here. And nested within it is another direct, two more directories, OK? So this hierarchical structure ends up being really important when we talk about navigating the location of files, OK? That's really important. So working directories. So here's the thing. Like, you have this huge computer. It's got, like, hundreds of gigs of information and your kernel just like can't deal with it all at once right because you have this limited memory um, that it has to deal with okay so the limitations there are really important um, so we have something called a working directory which essentially is the current location of the shell program within that file storage system so we can say here's the shell okay <laughs> um, at the top working directory um, when you enter a directory, the shell loads the memory metadata about those items like, you know, what's its name, what's its size, when it was last accessed, all that stuff that Finder was showing us, all that stuff that Bash was showing us, right? All the metadata. It doesn't load the file itself, just the metadata about the file. Um, so you can go down here to this directory. So we've gone in from this directory into this one and then change directories into this one. Um, and now all of the metadata from those files becomes you know, a part of the memory. So it's loaded that into memory. Uh, the shell only knows information about those items that are in the working directory, OK? It doesn't know anything else about items anywhere else on your computer, OK? And that's really important because that would hog all of the memory we have to do everything, right? So this is a way of uh, 
uh, sort of cutting down to what you only need in that moment, all right? So all of that other stuff is still there, it's in storage, but it's not accessible to the shell. It's not accessible to the kernel at that time, right? Okay, really important to remember because if you're in a working directory in R or in shell or something like that, you can't see that other stuff. The, the, the kernel can't see that other stuff that's in storage. Okay, remember where you are. Okay, so remember where your working directory is. And this will be really important later when we start loading stuff in from storage into memory in R. Um, you'll say like read.cvs and it'll be like, I don't know where that file is. And what it's saying is you, it's not in the working directory. You need to tell me where that file is, right? Good. Okay, so let's check your understanding really quick. If the shell's working directory were in the folder with the shell on it, um, what items would it see? So load metadata for those items. Would it be, so all of these are labeled with numbers 0, 1, 2, and 6, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13, 8 and 11 only, or all of it? So pause. Decide what you think. We'll go over the answer in a second. Are you ready for the correct answer? The correct answer is C, okay? Only eight and 11. The shell can't, uh, only sees the stuff in the working directory, which is just these two directories. Yeah, those two directories have files in them, but it can't see that stuff, okay? It can only see what's in the working directory. Information within that directory is hidden still. You would have to change directory into this directory to see the files nine and 10, okay? Hope that makes sense. Okay, so finding the location of an item. All right, you have this big hard drive. It's like, you know, has all these things and they're all really important and you need to access this, that, or the other, how can you tell the computer, tell the kernel, tell the shell, okay, I need the specific thing where its location is, okay? So let's talk about it. Each item has a location based on its position in this file system hierarchy, okay? And that's described by which directory that it occupies in order from the top, okay? So in order from the top, you can describe the location of the file five by saying it is in the zero directory and then in the one and then in the two directory, okay? So let's talk about what these directories, there are some special directories. Root directory is the computer's highest level directory, okay? And so this would be this, the zero, this is the root, okay? And it's often used in Linux-based OSs of which Mac OS is a Linux-based OS. Um, a forward slash is the root directory. So when you say change, go to the root directory, it sends you into that file, that top file, okay? Um, in Windows, it's C colon backslash. Uh, that's because it's MS-DOS based, it's really different, but the concept is the same as the root directory. So if we're uh, describing um, a file and its location independent of our working directory, we can say the location of this file three is you start at root, which is the slash, you go into one, and then you go into two, and there it is, okay? So it's forward slash one, forward slash two. This is the same in Windows, except you're using back, you're using C colon backslash one, backslash two, backslash, okay? So you're going into that two folder. The location of fol folder 11 right here is going to be really simple whoops, going to be really similar. You're in the root. Okay, that's the top level directory. You go into 14, and there it is in 14. Make sense? Okay. The home directory is another sp special type of directory. It gets, gets its special shortcut in command line. Um, it's a specific root user, or specific user's root directory. So if you have a computer and there's multiple users, your home directory is like kind of like the root directory. And the shortcut in command line is either dollar sign home in capital letters or uh, this thing called a tilde. That's the, uh, the button that's uh, to the left of the one on your keyboard and you shift and hold it, that's called a tilde. Um, this is the home directory. Let's say home directory is 14 uh, here. It doesn't have to be. It can be somewhere else, but we're going to just say it's home directory there. So the location of file 12 is, uh, you can do it in two ways, right? You can do root 14, 11, and then there's 
the file or dollar sign home, which takes you automatically to the home directory and then in 11 within the home directory. Make sense? Not too bad. So working directory, uh, the shortcut is a dot. Uh, a dot is uh, the working directory, okay, for your for your program. This will be important later when we get to uh, working directories in R. Um, if you don't tell it to include the word root directory, so if you don't include the slash, um, the shell is going to look in your working directory or whatever files uh, folders are in that working directory, okay? So if we want to say our shell is going to be this folder one, the location of three is just three is just two slash. Okay, so you're going from the working directory to two and then in, and then three is in two. Okay, so you notice that there's not a slash here in front because that sends you all the way back to the root and then you'd have to go all the way back to the root and then one, then in two and in three. Okay, makes sense? So it's the difference between here, right here and if your, if your working directory is in one. Uh, the location of file seven, so here's a good tip. Two dots means the directory above in the hierarchy, your current directory. So if you wanted to locate the file seven and you're in uh, and you're in uh, two, then you'd go up one and then into six and then seven, okay? So check your understanding. First, I want you to write down the location for file seven from the root directory, okay? And then I want you to write down the location for file seven if your current working directory is actually eight. Okay, so how can you locate the file seven if your working directory is an eight without using the root? Okay, so that's a little bit harder. Give you a question. And I'm not gonna go over this one. We're just gonna move on. But pause it here and try to write both those down. Okay, now why bother using directories to organize files. This is really important, you all. I know that a lot of this organization actually happens when you're using apps and you're using your phone and you're using your computer. You're just using those applications. A lot of this organization is happening in the background, okay? So the, the program, the app itself is doing this uh, organization for you. You just don't see it. But since we're getting more into programming, we're getting more into manipulating the guts of this, of the computer, we're gonna have to think more about organization. So why should you bother? Only the metadata, remember what we talked about, only the metadata file in the working directory has loaded into memory. But what if the directory have like a lot of files, like you have a lot of them because it's your downloads folder never clean it out. Um, now all of that is in memory, right? By having too many files in one directory folder, you just clutter up your memory with all sorts of junk that like, frankly, you just don't need, right? You don't need, if you're only interested in these three files, you don't need all that other bunkus, bump, bumpus stuff uh, in there, right? It also makes it super hard to find stuff, super hard to keep track of stuff, remember which versions you are which, what's related to what, what you downloaded and what you didn't, right? It just makes it really super confusing. So do yourself a massive favor right now as we start and organize your files into separate directories. Create a course directory, that's where all the stuff is gonna go and take the like extra half a second it takes to like do a new folder, put all that stuff that's related to that homework in that folder or that lecture in that folder. It's okay if only one thing ends up being in a folder. That's fine because you've got this organization set up and it'll be working for you at the time that you really need it, okay? And here is like a PSA. Don't work in your downloads folder. Don't, 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 don't. <laughs> so I've had a lot of problems in the past with students downloading stuff from Canvas. It goes straight into your downloads folder. You click it, you open it. First of all, you don't know where that, that file is. Second, if you download another copy and work on that, you'll be confused about which copy it is. It's very confusing. It's hard to keep track. It's hard to sort through that stuff because there's a bunch of like garbage in there. Just when you download stuff, just hop into that working directory or uh, the downloads directory and just pull it somewhere else, pull it into the course directory where I just organize your stuff. Because again, it's gonna slow down your computer if you're trying to work in that downloads directory all the time. Desktop, by the way, is even worse because when you're on your desktop, it's 
it's uh, your computer, the operating system is constantly refreshing what that desktop should look like. So my desktop is over here, right here. Um, and if you have a thousand things, it has to constantly refresh that like three times a second. <laughs> so don't work on your, even if you send like a thousand things into one folder on your desktop, that makes it so much faster. Okay, like this revolution or revolutionized my life when I learned this. Okay, so try to take, keep your desktop neat. Even if you have like just a random folder um, on your desktop, that will help it because it'll put it out of that working directory for that computer. Okay, so don't work in your downloads folder. I'm gonna come after you if you work in your downloads folder. Don't do it, don't do it. Okay, so that's it. Um, so uh, the action items for next time is you're gonna complete, complete assignments 1.2 and 1.3. Okay, so there's due a week from when this lecture, uh, when the lecture uh, in class person, um, in person portion of the lecture drops, uh, and then review computer games for the next class. So there should be a PDF uh, for lecture um, number three named computer games. It's going to be a fun in class activity. We're not going to have a video lecture uh, prep. You'll just read that PDF uh, before you come to class and be ready to go. And so with that, I think I am pretty much done. Um, I sure hope you have a good uh, week, good weekend, and I'll see you in class on Wednesday.